Well, welcome everybody. It's uh, it's exciting to be here. I've 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 actually been uh, anticipating this for for an even longer time than than maybe even uh, June. Uh, I've been working with Loann for the for the last almost it seems almost a couple of years it seems to you know on on many projects you know related to uh, the preservation of the CCC camp here in Leeds and and. Uh, Yep, my interest. I've, I I go way back. My father came from Hurricane, and so uh, and so this has been a place that's been very special to me. Even though I grew up in northern Utah, so I've got quite a bit of red sand in my shoes. I've been interested in the history of southern Utah for uh, several years. I've I've worked uh, with the LDS Church on, on the documentation of the Mountain Meadows massacre for about for for seven years, and and uh, have done research on the construction of the St. George Temple and various other public works programs at Zion National Park, Dixie National Forest, uh, with the CCC, so it almost feels like I'm home here. <laughs> yes, so I'm excited to be here, and it's exciting to be such a, such a great group uh, to, to be associated with here, at, here in Leeds. So, well, just to get started, um, buried deep in the December 2nd, 1937 edition of the Washington County News was an article about the projects planned for Company 585 of the Civilian Conservation Corps stationed here in Leeds. Among three projects of interest was um, one that would protect the 12,000 acre watershed area around the Washington fields from erosion of valuable range and farmlands. The structures these young men built demonstrate the beginnings of a more scientific method of managing ecosystems. The project's primary purpose was to protect the region's most important resources the irrigation water that fed into the agricultural fields and towns. Since the first Mormon settlements were established in the mid-19th century, residents constantly struggled to build and repair irrigation systems. Flooding from the Virgin River sent high volumes of water, mud, and debris, which destroyed dams and silted up ditches, leaving a path of destruction in their wake. With the help of the newly established Federal Soil Conservation Service, Local residents looked at how to resolve problems associated with flood erosion more broadly. Rather than protecting just the channels from which the water in the Washington Fields Canal flowed, the SES brought new conservation technologies that spread the flooding out over a landscape and decreased the amount of erosion debris that reached the canal. The Civilian Conservation Corps constructed the SES design structures, which resulted in a more reliable flow through the dam and the canal. Since the completion of that project in 1938, the earth and rock structures uh, the CCC built in the hills overlooking the now sprawling communities of Washington and St. George garnered little notice until the recent construction of the Southern Parkway, which now bypasses several of the remaining structures. What I hope to accomplish with this presentation is to first give you a brief history of the Washington Fields Dam and Canal, as well as its importance to the settlement and development of the local communities here which will then help me explain the reasons why residents sought federal assistance to protect one of their community's most precious assets during the Great Depression. The entire context of this story illustrates why the Washington County News article stated 77 years ago that this was indeed a project of interest. Understanding the Washington, uh, understanding the Washington Fields Project requires context to uh, about the local ecology and the history. The Washington Fields Canal diverts its water from the Virgin River, one of the nation's swiftest flowing rivers. The river runs 160 miles from the Markagunt Plateau, just above Zion National Park, uh, at 9,500 feet above sea level, and then meanders through slot canyons and desert plains before reaching Lake Mead, which now drowns its confluence with the Colorado River at about uh, 1,700 feet above sea level dropping at, a, at, a, at an average rate of 48 feet per mile. However, it's unpredictable flow that has made it a difficult water source to tap. In the Washington Fields region alone, the river's flow is an average of 183 cubic feet per second, but can fluctuate between extremes of 15,000 cubic feet per second at flood stage and no flow whatsoever during severe drought. Small pockets of creosite, rabbit brush, challa, brittle brush, sagebrush, and other wild grasses only occasionally break up the lifeless desert landscape and the red sand and stone. 
The narrow canyons, loose alkali soil, and sparse vegetation do little to hold back the walls of water and debris during frequent flash floods. As with any community, especially in the desert, water was the most precious resource. Long before the first Spanish and Anglo-Americans arrived in this region, Native Americans found, their, found ways to irrigate from the unpredictable river with moderate success. Parley P. Pratt, the first Mormon explorer of the region in the winter of 1849-50, noted a few small irrigated gardens with corn, pumpkins, squash, and squash near the riverbanks. When the Mormon settlers arrived in the region during the, during the 1850s, they viewed taming the Virgin River as a challenge that would only temporarily impede their ability to make the desert blossom as the rose, using an oft-quoted reference to an Old Testament scripture in Isaiah. The first Mormon explorers saw past the country's barrenness to envision its perceived potential. The community's leader, Parley P. Pratt, said that the area had three or four thousand acres of desirable land which contained loose, sandy, fertile soil, easily watered. See, he noticed he came in the wintertime, not in the summertime, and that probably influenced how he viewed the landscape. So other explorations in subsequent years gave similar glowing reports which said more about their belief in their ability to cultivate the land than actual knowledge about local ecology. Those reports uh, more closely explain a 19th century environmental ethos more than they were an accurate portrayal of the natural conditions. Mormons, like other Americans during that time, viewed the inhabited, uninhabited West through the lands of its potential over its present uh, condition. They considered open land a veritable garden that, with proper care, could produce in great abundance. Improving the landscape also had the ennobling characteristics such as a living independently off their own production. Thomas Jefferson's agrarian dream was predicated on the belief that America's future was tied to the availability of land. And this perception motivated ideas and policies like Western Expansion, Manifest Destiny, and even the Homestead Act of 1862. For many 19th century Americans, Mormons included, nature could be subdued through hard work and determination. The only thing that was beyond their control was the climate, which only determined the length of growing season and the type of crops used. In areas where water was scarce, they believed the difference could be made up through proper irrigation. Religious belief was also a major factor in Mormons' conception of the environment. Mormons often quoted the scriptures, such as the one in Isaiah, the wilderness and the solitary place shall be glad for them, and the desert shall rejoice and blossom as the rose. The Doctrine and Covenants, a sacred Mormon scripture, further declares that the fullness of the earth belongs to the people who dwell on it, but should be managed wisely. It further states, quote, Yea, all things come from the earth in the season thereof, and made for the benefit and the use of man, both to please the eye and gladden the heart. Yea, for food and for raiment, for taste and for smell, to strengthen the body and to enliven the soul. And it pleaseth God that he hath given all these things unto man, for unto this end, were they made to be used with judgment, not to excess, neither by exhortation. The close quote. Therefore, the land's ability to produce determined its value and its beauty. When referring to the value of the Cotton Mission's principal city, Brigham Young spoke of its beauty in agrarian terms. He said in 1874, St. George is one of the most beautiful places on this little farm, this world that we occupy, this little farm of the Lord's, one of the choicest places on the face of the earth. Again, notice he came only in the wintertime, too. So, <laughs> Despite several setbacks, Mormons' faith that they could redeem the desert and make it similar to the American South is what sustained the cotton mission throughout the rest of the 19th century. In the spring of 1857, the first uh, Mormon settlers camped on the Washington fields and immediately began work constructing irrigation ditches. Most of these initial uh, pioneers were experienced cotton growers from the South, hoping to make the crop a uh, part of Utah's self-sustaining economy. Mormon efforts to irrigate the mountain valleys in northern Utah proved uh, to be at least moderately successful in creating sustainable agriculture. But they had not yet proven the same in a harsh desert climate with a river subject, uh, subject to catastrophic flooding. Their optimism, however, was short-lived when the missionaries realized they overestimated the quality of the soil and water. George A. Smith, um, St. George himself, who uh, the city's named after, who passed through Washington in August, only a few months after um, 
only a few months uh, um, after the settlement, observed that the water of the Rio Virgin was poisoning the cotton. He also noted that the sandy soil and scorching temperatures made it difficult to keep water on the thirsty plants. The following year, alkalis in the soil choked off most of their early crops. Of the estimated 400 acres planted throughout the entire mission, more than two-thirds failed, chiefly from salt and other minerals in the soil, according to the Desert News. The desert, was produced, uh, the desert also produced cool nights and parching winds, which damaged crops. The biggest challenge, however, was taming the Virgin River. In 1857 alone, flash floods wiped out two or three dams at Washington and destroyed another further downstream at Heberville. Repairing and replacing dams became an annual labor. Malaria also swept through the discouraged communities, which were already struggling to grow enough food to survive. Many simply gave up. By the summer of 1861, only 20 families remained in Washington. One particular flood in the winter of 1861-62 caused incredible devastation throughout the Virgin River Basin, sweeping away several fields, buildings, and even settlements. Um, the, the saints, you know, that lived uh, here said it was, it was, they explained in almost biblical terms. They said it rained for 40 days and 40 nights. Heberville and Tonaquint, two communities near the confluence of the Virgin and the Santa Clara Rivers, were at a complete loss. In 1865, a report on the cost of irrigation systems revealed that these cash um, strap uh, Utah communities had expended uh, $167,421.59, which was a heavy price to pay at the time, on an irrigation systems in less than just one decade. The Washington fields alone accounted for about 80,000 of those costs. Being called the Dixie caused, caused major apprehension to those aware of the trials that lie ahead of them. Popular folk songs express the sentiments of many and the constant conflict between the environmental realities and their leader's vision. One popular song attributed to George Hicks reads, Oh, once I lived in Cottonwood and owned a little farm, but I was called the Dixie, which did me much alarm. To raise the cane and cotton, I right away must go, but the reason why they called me there, I'm sure I do not know. Next, we got to Washington, where we stayed a little while, to see if April share showers would make the Verdere smile. But, oh, I was mistaken, and so I went away, for the red hills of November look just the same in May. I feel so weak and hungry now. There's nothing here to cheer, except prophetic sermons, which we do very often hear. They will hand them out by the dozens and prove them by the book, but I'd rather get some roasting ears to stay at home and cook. Charles Lowell Walker, who is considered St. George's Poet Laureate, penned another song entitled St. George and the Drag On. <laughs> oh, what a desert place this was when first the Mormons found it. They said no white men could live here and Indians prowled around it. They said the land was, it was no good and the water it was no gooder and the bare idea of living here was enough to make one shudder. Although the main lyrics of, uh, gave off a feeling of dread, Walker's chorus portrayed a Mormon hope that St. George and the surrounding communities' air will be a place that everyone admires. Over time, settlers gained more knowledge about the ecological cycles, yet remained at a loss as to how to protect their irrigation systems. A committee of landowners in St. George issued a report in 1867 explained that the flow was predictable but impossible to master, stating that, quote, the Virgin River is usually high in the spring and difficult to control, and it, generally, it, and it is generally late in the season before water can be turned on into the ditches for irrigation. In addition, monsoonal thunderstorms in the late summer, quote, frequently bring down heavy floods in the Virgin, washing away our dams and filling up our ditches, causing us much labor and expense to repair, and leaving us without water, sometimes for weeks, causing great injury to our crops in the field, as they are not usually so far advanced in their growth and the lands being drier and poorer. Joseph A. Young expressed the problem more succinctly. Controlling the water in this country, it is a difficult matter to what it is in the settlements north. It is not uncommon for the brethren to build a dam that costs four or five thousand dollars and have it washed away within a few days, and so on ad infinitum. And after another flood destroyed the Washington Fields in 1885, the cooperative Washington Fields Canal Company tried a new expensive technological improvements that would hold back the raging water. The company purchased a pile driver to thrust four rows of tall ponderosa pines into 
uh, from nearby Pine Valley into the bedrock of the river bed. The rows would then be filled with rocks to add greater stability and strength, which you can see actually right here in this picture. You can see how they filled in the rocks. There's the pile-driven um, logs that they, that they filled in. Company leader Charles Siegmiller, reflecting on the pile driven uh, dam's completion in 1866, celebrated, Well, we finished it. Look at it with satisfaction. And then said, Now there is a dam that will be permanent. We have mastered the river at last. That dam held for the next three years, though no floods were reported during that time. The lull ended in dramatic fashion in the winter of 1889-90 when two of the largest ever recorded floods snapped the large logs and left a gaping hole in the dam, making it comparatively worthless, according to to report. Within a few years, only half of Washington's population had given up and moved away. Those who remained pressed on undaunted in finding a permanent solution to taming the untamable Virgin River. The canal company decided the best thing to do was to construct an all-rock dam. They moved the dam uh, site upriver to where the Virgin Anticline is. And you can see this is a, kind of an aerial photo. If you, you know, just look over the hills there, you can actually see where this is. So here's the Virgin Anticline right here. And so they moved the dam right. You can see this, this is the Washington Fields. So they moved it right in the middle of there so they could have a stronger foundation from which to, to build their, their dam. In the end, the rock dam proved to be the most expensive, but the best solution, costing nearly $60,000. The larger dam along the holding reservoir and new ditches also increased the amount of arable land. Uh, although the rock dam proved to finally be the solution Washington and St. George residents had hoped for, the dam and canal still required constant maintenance and improvements. The residents who tirelessly tried to hold back the tide of devastating flash floods were also simultaneously contributing to their increasing intensity and frequency. Overgrazing of the already delicate landscape appeared to be the biggest culprit. When raising cotton and other crops proved to be impractical and unprofitable, residents turned to ranching as an alternative. The demand for cattle dramatically increased during the 1870s and 1880s to feed the growing populations of St. George, Washington, and now the mining boom town of Silver Reach, which had just sprung up uh, in those decades. Alfalfa replaced cotton in the Washington fields. Only available rain, all, any available rangeland soon became overgrazed. By 1900, about 10,000 cattle ranged in Washington County and perhaps Thousands more were using the winter pastures on the Arizona Strip. The, uh, the Fort Pierce Wash Road, which is on, um, on this side of the anticline, uh, became the main thoroughfare for thousands of livestock moving between those two ranges. The valleys surrounding the road were severely overgrazed and vulnerable to severe erosion and flash flooding. So in the opening decades of the 20th century, overgrazing and soil erosion proved to be a concern in a far larger area than just surrounding the Washington fields. The entire American West, in fact, observed scars on the landscape left by grazing and commercialized agriculture. In fact, these are some pictures of, of San Pete County. Um, you can see the uh, sheep had overgrazed it so bad that, it, uh, that the vegetation was stripped clear down to the uh, bedrock. And uh, this is Manti. Every time a thunderstorm would come through Manti, large uh, logs and boulders the size of small cars would just roll down Main Street. So, and then there's some terracing that, uh, that uh, was built, you know, by the, by the CCC in later years. So, because the problem was so widespread, the federal government stepped in to fill the need for central planting and contribute the vast resources needed to administer the land. Government agencies such as the U.S. Forest Service and the National Park Service looked to science and technology as a means of conserving the land. Um, the establishment of Utah's, um, most of Utah's national forest and other government uh, regulations on grazing received widespread local support because overgrazing caused severe floods that tear through many Utah towns built along streams flowing out of the mountain canyons. 
The federal government possessed the power of law and the vast resources to reduce grazing. In addition, the government invested in several studies to understand the source of flooding in order to devise solutions to reduce their destructive impact. During uh, the Great Depression, President Franklin D. Uh, Roosevelt made preventing catastrophic soil erosion one of his priorities of the New Deal, forming the Soil Conservation Service and the Civilian Conservation Corps. The Soil Conservation uh, Service, also known as the SCS, formed in part as a reaction to the Dust Bowl. We can see a photograph of the Dust Bowl uh, there in Oklahoma and, and parts of Kansas and Arkansas, northern Texas as well which uh, were which caused violent storms which were exasperated uh, through years of mechanized farm uh, farming stripping the topsoil off the land the SES developed several methods to combat the catastrophic erosion one particularly effective strategy the SES employed was called upstream engineering rather than trying to minimize the damaging effects of flooding at the point of its impact as early Washington and St. George residents had done, SCS engineers looked at how they could slow down and spread out floodwaters at their source, preventing soil and debris from washing downstream. These engineers used a variety of, of, of fields to design the most effective technologies to spread out the floodwaters, including hydrology, botany, climatology, geology, soil mechanics, and landscape architecture, among other possible subjects. These engineers needed to understand exactly how water moved over the landscape and how it reacted to vegetation, soil, and other ground materials. Also, in devising structures to reduce the impacts of flooding, the engineers wanted to use natural materials that would blend into the environment but still strong enough to, to stand the test of time. While many of these structures, the SES design, such as the ones overlooking the Washington Fields, appear unremarkable, the seemingly random mounds of dirt and piles of rock require an impressive amount of research and planning. Now, the Civilian Conservation Corps was the government's conservation labor during the New Deal. They were referred to as Franklin Roosevelt's um, Tree Army. Throughout the uh, country, the CCC worked on a variety of projects to meet national and local needs. Each camp was designated to one government agency, such as the U.S. Forest Service, National Park Service, or Grazing Service. The SES sponsored hundreds of camps throughout the country to plant trees, cut terraces, and build flood control features. In Washington County, 15 CCC camps were established, more than any other Utah county. These camps built trails and campgrounds, improved roadways and bridges, and built features that prevented wildfires and flash flooding. The Soil Conservation Service also operated companies at various times throughout Washington uh, County, mostly involved in erosion control and irrigation projects such as the Washington Fields Project. Former CCC worker in the Washington County, uh, Tony Melissa, recalled that working for the SES camp required building quote, dams and cleaned out washes and stuff like that. Anything to do with dirt, close quote. While these men engaged in projects that promoted the overall national goal of conservation, most of their projects filled local needs. The Washington Fields Project is an ideal example of where national and local interests intersected. As leaders of the St. George and Washington Canal Company were preparing for another growing season in early 1937, they contemplated plans on how to improve the dam and canal once again. While the rock dam at the Virgin Anticline still remained in place, the company had to be vigilant about repairing any leaks or clogs in the canal itself. Periodic flooding from the surrounding hills remained the largest concern because of their inability to damage uh, canal walls and clogging water channels with silt and debris. The company's solution was to line the ca canal walls with concrete to prevent seepage and leaks, but this did nothing to address the ever-increasing gravel and silt deposits from floods. Machinery designed to clean the debris could help, but still did not address the problem of preventing erosion on the hillside. At their board meeting on March 14, 1937, the company invited a Mr. Dobbs, an assistant engineer for the Soil Conservation Service, to suggest and help in protecting farms from floods in the river and reclaiming depleted soil. Dobbs suggested that the company petition the SES district manager, a Mr. G.S. Quaite, for assistance in providing the capital and resources to protect the Washington Fields. 
After the, this initial meeting, plans to shore up the entire hillside were soon put into place. That summer, the CCC transferred Company 585 from Gunlock, 25 miles north of St. George, and reopened the Leeds camp, which had been vacant since March of 1934. At, since March of 1934. At its height, during the winter of 1937-38, the Leeds camp had 280 enrollees, much larger than the average 200 at other Utah CCC camps. While the company was involved in several projects that winter to prevent the erosion of 330,000 acres throughout Washington County, it appeared the Washington Fields project was one of the priority assignments that prompted the transfer to Leeds. As soon as that year's harvest was in and the irrigation turned off for the year, Company 585 swarmed the hillsides above Washington Fields Canal and other waterways throughout the Virgin River Basin. Whenever the CCC worked on private land, it was the responsibility of the landowner to provide many of the supplies and building materials necessary for the project. The canal company therefore supplied the CCC with gunpowder for blasting, cement, and gasoline for all of their machinery. With the CCC's help, the canal company was able to have improvements they have the improvements they needed to the canal and the surrounding countryside in place before the next growing season could start. According to the canal company records, the steep hills above Turner and Westover family farms near the head of the canal required the most attention. The CCC built structures found in Long Valley above the Washington fields. And these, and these are the ones that uh, were evaluated as part of the uh, survey of the Southern Parkway. So, so here is the Long Valley. Here's the Virgin River Anticline looking to the north. Okay. You can see the Washington Fields Canal Dam here, and then the, the canal runs along these green fields here. So if you were to take this valley and kind of superimpose it here, you can see, um, and, uh, it's very faint, but these, these, uh, these little you know, kind of mounds and burns, these are, these are where all of the CCC features existed. Okay. And I'll explain how they work here in just a second. So... Okay. Oops. There we go. All right. Okay. Within the area, there are 92 documented CCC built features, primarily consisting of rock spetters, earthen berms, gully plugs, and rock piles. These structures found above the canal were hallmarks of the SCS design and CCC built upstream engineering. Similar structures were erected and proven in several other sites throughout the West. So here you can see kind of a uh, a check dam here. This is uh, UDOT um, engineer uh, Eric um, Hansen who, who helped with, with uh, our study of, of the dam. And these, these dams would eventually lead to these U-shaped spreaders right here. And so here you got some gully plugs as well. So here's how they worked. Okay. So here's kind of a cutout of a, of a hillside here. Okay. Now the SES planned each feature for a specific function and strategically placed them at areas where they would be most effective. So if this was the water flow from a flood going downstream, the overall idea was to spread the flood rotters over a wide area and separate out the debris, which would then lessen the destructive force behind the floods and prevent runoff from channeling into the washes. So you put an earthen berm Around the, uh, around the channel to kind of divert the water in, in a couple different directions. Now, the earthen berms typically involve the most labor and equipment and were central to the supervising SES engineers' plans. Bulldozers or tractors were used to make diversion mounds or slopes to force the water flow away from the channels. Then on the edge of the berms, you would put a couple U-shaped spreaders. Okay, these, these kind of rock piles that were uh, in a shape of a U where the U was facing the direction of the water. Now the U-shaped spreaders placed at the end of the berms were used to dissipate the energy from the floodwaters and force the spreading of the waters over a wider area. The rocks of the spreaders were locally excavated and put into place by hand. Now the idea is, is that they, they would have percolators, so little holes within, within the spreaders. And these features um, would, would cause the sediment to, to hit uh, the uh, spreader and therefore trap the debris behind them and then the water would just kind of slowly percolate outside of the spreaders. 
in the gaps between the rocks. Now the nutrient-rich soil that built up behind the shredders created ideal places for reed vegetation, which further enhanced the entire project's effectiveness. The gully plugs and ruck piles were simply dams placed in small washes to keep the water from cutting deeper channels and further erosion. So, let's see. All right, so here's now, now the, the flow of the water goes through these and then just kind of filters out at a much slower and wider range without that very devastating debris behind it. So put together, these structures were effective in spreading the flow of water and forcing it to drop sediment and debris before it ever reached the Washington Fields Canal Dam below. Okay. Now these structures located above the Washington Fields Dam and Canal uh, comp comprises only a fraction of the infrastructure built by the CCC Company 585 and the Soil Conservation Service in Washington County during that same winter. The CCC boys widened and improved the county road that connected the project worksite with the town of Washington, uh, which has now been widened again as part of the Southern uh, Parkway. And the Washington County News reported on January 13, 1938, that the company built several dams on tributaries that fed into the Virgin River. At Bloomington, three miles south of St. George, the CCC erected a large concrete dam and a small earthen one. The company also constructed a more extensive array of erosion control features similar to the ones above Washington Fields with, addition, with the addition of contour trenching along the west-facing slopes just southeast of St. George. Another project 18 miles east of Leeds, another concrete diversion dam was established on the North Creek along with 16 overshoot drops, which, um, most of which were built out of rough-hewn masonry. To accommodate the heavy workload, nearly 100 reinforcements were sent to Company 585 from other camps in Utah. On April 3rd and 4th, 1938, the Leeds Camp opened its doors for a celebration commemorating the fifth anniversary of the CCC's founding and the completion of their winter projects. Residents from throughout Washington County uh, attended the festivities that involved a concert from the Dixie College Band, an open house to tour the camp facilities, and several presentations and speeches from the CCC and community leaders. Two of the speeches were entitled, quote, What the CCC has done for me, close quote, and also, What the SCS is doing for Washington County. The reception from local communities proved that the citizens of Washington County are definitely interested interested in the camp, um, in what the camp at Leeds is doing, observed the Washington County News. The celebration was a fitting conclusion to a project that brought together federal agencies and local residents to solve a problem that plagued the communities for over three quarters of a century. In the years and decades following Washington Fields Project, the Virgin River continues to roll along the desert landscape with its temperamental cycles of drought and flash floods. While some of these floods continue to wreak havoc and destruction on Washington and St. George, the dam and canal remain standing. Through the remaining though the remaining structures built by the CCC continue to work as intended in the hills of Long Valley, today water is provided in the communities through several upgraded irrigation systems that are fed from large res reservoirs such as Quail Creek and Sand Hollow that are fed through reliable pipelines to homes, businesses, other buildings and fields alike. Farmers on the Washington fields are not as worried that, uh, that the next storm will wash away the dam and canal. In the words of Leeds Camp Commanding Officer Neil W. Lamb, the rugged and simple technologies of the Soil Conservation Service designed and um, the ones that the Soil Conservation Service designed and the Civilian Conservation Corps built during the winter of 1937-38 accomplished, quote, something of real value for Washington County, close quote. Thank you so much. As, as I understand it, the ones that were not, um, the, the road went through uh, part of them, but as I understand it, the, the, the other spreaders are still there, and there are actually several of them throughout um, uh, the Virgin River Basin, you know, and Yeah, they still work. I mean, they still they still do what they, they intended to do, and and you can you know if you actually go up to the spreaders, you know where when I did a, a couple years ago, you can you know see vegetation growing behind them. You can see where the silt and debris has, has built up behind them. So it seems to they they still work as they are intended. 
So when I went up with Eric Hansen, it was really interesting because we, we had no idea why they were building those, especially in Long Valley. We were, we were like, we, um, it, it kind of puzzled us why there as opposed to other places. You know, and the, I, the initial idea was this is just a make work project during the Great Depression. You know, it's something to, to get the, them to do. And as we stood up on the, on the hillside, I said, now this looks very deliberate. And I said, what's that downstream? He says, that's the Washington Fields Canal Dam. And I said, that, that must be it. So quick check over at Dixie uh, State's uh, archives where they have the Washington Canal uh, Company records. You know, just look up about the time we knew that Company 585 was here in Leeds. And sure enough, the whole story was just right there. So. Yeah, it was, it was supposed to be mutually beneficial for, for several different groups. I mean, I, you know, besides, you know, uh, protecting a federal need to, for more conservation in the West, I mean, obviously the, lo the local interest in protecting the Washington Fields Canal. But for many of these young men, it was, you know, it was designed, you had to be single, um, and uh, you had to be, I think, under the age of 25 or so, and then they, they would bring you to the camp, they paid you $25 a month, 20 of that, uh, those dollars had to be sent home to take care of your family, while well, five of it you could use uh, for, uh, for your own recreation. Well, five dollars a month doesn't seem like much, but on top of that, they paid for your room, your board, your meals. They had all kinds of recreational activities, you know, and of course, educational opportunities as well. So it was a great, you know, blessing for, for many of these young men, you know, not just the opportunity to work, but also, you know, for, for uh, personal development and growth. So thank you for bringing that up. In fact, what's really interesting about you know the CCC camps here in Utah is, is you had a, a good number of them you know coming from you know eastern states you know a lot of them from like uh, the Midwest or or the Mid Atlantic New York New Jersey you know that area, but they would also hire what they called uh, um, local experts you know and uh, and they and so because they knew the topography they knew the land. Um, they knew the people and, and, and could uh, develop relationships that way. Having locals, you know, work here as well was, was very beneficial to, to these CCC camps. Yeah. And, you know, it's actually really kind of neat that you have these buildings still standing. I mean, my, my, uh, my uncle, you know, took me out to the CCC camp that's, that's out in front of, you know, Schultz and Products and, and, and Hurricane. And all that's left is just a few foundation stones. I mean, there's, there's nothing that you wouldn't even know what it was unless somebody pointed out to you. Yeah. Okay, so here is the uh, Southern Parkway, okay? So um, there's, there's Sand Hollow Reservoir, so you know where Sand Hollow is, okay? Here's the Virgin River Anticline here, okay? And so it crosses the Virgin River Anticline and then it turns south and, and that's when it's going through Long Valley is, is when it turns south after the Anticline. So just, you know, just west of, of, uh, of Sand Hollow Reservoir as it goes, you know, that sharp razorback uh, ridge that, that sticks out as the anticline. So that's, that's where Long Valley is. That help you out? Yes. So right now I am working with the uh, American West Center. And uh, it's, it's, a, it's a research group out of the University of Utah. And uh, we just received a contract with uh, the local BML, BLM office here in, uh, in St. George. And, and uh, me and another researcher, we're going to um, go through and document some of the historic sites um, around uh, the national conservation areas, you know, mostly Beaver Dam Wash, but my, my responsibility will be the Red Cliffs National Conservation Area. So we'll, Silver Reef, Babylon, you know, the Babylon Road, um, and some, you know, some of these, in fact, some of these are, are these other irrigation products. It's like the, the Cottonwood Creek um, uh, Canal, uh, now Pipeline, you know, and, and uh, some of these others, the Orson Adams Home, the movie sets, so it'll be fun. A little bit. I, I go right. We, I think the National Conservation Area, the border, it borders the on the north to the uh, to the National Forest Service. So wherever the National Forest Service land begins is where is where we're yeah we're complete. But yeah, there's a few of those old roads that we still document. So. so we've already started. In fact, I I, I was I was at the BLM office all, all this morning, uh, scanning documents and looking for uh, looking for resources. So. Yeah. It'll, it'll go until next year and so we, we will write, uh, we will create a database for them, we will create a, 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 a little narrative history uh, for them and so, yeah.
the the hope is is that this will be used by the BLM when they make an you know interpretive signage you know and 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 other things. So it'll be a resource for them to help them document uh, their sources in a variety of ways, either you know on their website, you know on signs uh, at those actual sites, and possibly even making the narrative history available. I'm I'm not sure exactly what their ultimate plans are, but you know, but they use it for a variety of reasons. Yeah.